Okay, 30 seconds till start. This is exciting. And five, four, three, two, one, let's get going. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the WSB Direct Connect webinar series, Strategies to Engage Today's Diverse Audience, powered by eSpeakers. You know, it's always a challenge for event planners to create events that engage the full diversity of our audiences, even within a special interest group, a single interest group or profession. There are differences in learning styles and activity preferences, for example, not to mention differences related to different cultures and language. Now, as professional event planners, our job is to continually look at how we can make our events more inclusive, more engaging, and well, more enjoyable and more educational. Now, WSB Direct Connect, we want to help you do that, and that's why we created this webinar series. Today's session will be focusing on the insights and strategies for how you can create meetings with cross-generational appeal. My name is Michelle Nure. I'm your moderator for today. I'm the founder of Mo Mondays. Mo Mondays is a monthly variety show that blends together personal, inspirational storytelling, comedy, and live music. Mo Mondays is now in 14 cities. I'm also a professional speaker, and I help my audiences leverage the power of purposeful storytelling in sales, branding, and leadership. All right, enough about me. Let's get to a little bit of housekeeping. So before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to highlight a few things to keep in mind during today's session. If you experience any technical difficulties, please type them in the Q&A box located on your screen. It's probably right there at the bottom. Now you can also use this box to ask questions. We'll be fielding questions throughout this webinar. It's an interactive webinar after all. And we'll have a Q&A period at the end of this session. We'll also be opening it up throughout. Any questions not answered will be posted on the Washington Speakers Bureau blog in the next few days, along with the recording of this presentation. Now, we're also live tweeting today. So join us and connect with other meeting planners at hashtag diverse audiences 16. So once again, that's hashtag diverse audiences 16. And finally, you will be receiving CE credits for today's webinar. Pretty good. If you're watching this event live, your credits will be applied automatically in the next few days. And if you're watching the recording, please email wsbdirectconnect at washingtonspeakers.com to request your credit. Okay. Thank you for your patience as I went through some of these items. And now, what you've been waiting for. So let me tell you about our speaker. And I, I have to tell you, as an event planner myself, I am doubly interested in what we're going to be speaking about today. Karen McCullough. She's been called a branding expert. And she's worked with Ralph Lauren. She's a social media enthusiast. She tweets, and we're going to be tweeting today. She is a millennial evangelist which really means she sees the future. And she has the most fun you will ever have while learning. Now, Karen helps organizations cut through generational stereotypes, which is exactly what we're doing right now. Karen, on to you. Whoa, hope I am fun today. Thank you, thanks Michelle. And I'm happy that you're all here today for our program on the cross-generational appeal in our meetings. So are you ready to get started? I am. Get going. So I thought that I would start, hang on a second guys, I thought I would start with a story. Since I am a speaker, I love to tell stories and this story is about cross-generation. So there I am, Kara McCullough. I am a baby boomer and across from me is Crystal Washington and Crystal Washington is a fellow speaker, she's a millennial. I met Crystal in 2010. It was an interesting meeting because I heard that she was this social media guru in Houston, and I needed to learn about social media. 
Turns out she actually wanted to take the stage and become a speaker. So we didn't even realize that we were cross mentoring, but that's exactly what we were doing. She taught me the tricks of Facebook. I got on Twitter right away, Instagram, and I began teaching her about keynoting and taking the stage. And then I got her to join my National Speakers Association and to come with me to the annual conference. I was like so excited. I have never missed an NSA conference and I was sure she was gonna love it, right? <clears throat> So we got to the conference and the opening speaker was my favorite and I said, you're going to just love this keynoter. And I could see when she was sitting there, she was fidgeting a little bit. I could feel like a little, eh, I'm not crazy about the speaker, but I didn't say too much. And then afterwards, she said, the speaker was okay. And as the conference went on, one day we were having lunch and she said she was going to leave the conference. We were in Anaheim and she was going to go to Disney. She was going to take off and go to Disney during this conference, I couldn't believe it because I never miss a session. I take notes. I get the, the programs afterwards. I listen to the tapes, but she was taking off. When the conference was over, we kind of debriefed each other, and it was interesting because what I loved, she didn't. And she told me that she could miss sessions because she was going to listen to them on tape. And it hit me. I was speaking on the generations at the time, and I realized baby boomers and millennials do not think alike. And I started thinking about our conferences and I realized that this is really the foundation, right? A tale of two generations. How are we going to have cross-generational meetings where we can appeal to both the baby boomer, the Gen X, and the millennial? So before I get into this, I have a brief word on stereotypes, okay? I have to put the generations in categories. That's, that's what we do. It's, a, it's really the only way we can study them. But I know that you're sitting out there and I may say something about a baby boomer and it, it isn't you. I'm sure it isn't. And you're going to say, well, I am, I'm not like that at all. And that's the reality of this. I have to speak in generations and stereotypes. So I hope that I'm not really offending any of you when I start talking about the generations and tell you about them. So what I thought I would do in the beginning is just kind of briefly tell you about the generations, give you the dates. And I want you to realize that you can find other dates. Some people say that the baby boomer was from 1946 to 64. Others say that the Gen Xers started in 1968. So sometimes you're going to see the generational dates kind of change, but these are the dates that I'm going to be using right now. When I'm giving my presentations, I really talk about how a person goes through their era, and many baby boomers find out that really, deep down inside, they're Gen Xers. They're not even baby boomers because they're, maybe their mom worked and they had more independence and they got their computer when they were much younger. So I want you to understand that these dates definitely can vary, right? So what I started with at the top of the screen are the traditionalists and the Gen Xers. These are the fringe. When I started speaking years ago, traditionalists were still in the workplace, but today we just have about 1% of the traditionalists in the workforce today. And Gen Z really hasn't really they probably have started working in restaurants, maybe, and the movie theater, but they're not really attending the conferences just yet. So today I'm going to focus on the baby boomer, the Generation X, Gen Y, or the millennial. They're both in my, they're both the same. So let's start with the baby boomer. So the baby boomer was born between the date 1946 and 1964. So they're they're turning 70, or they've just started to become 70. No, excuse me. Yeah, they have. I'm sorry. They're turning 70 right now. So many of them are still in the workforce, though. We have 31%. And it's interesting because in some firms, like in legal, you're going to find that there are more baby boomers. Uh, maybe in the government, there are less baby boomers because they're retiring. So I'm not quite sure what your conference is uh, accommodating. But the reality of it is, is basically there's about 31% in the workforce. So what do they want right now? When they're going to a meeting, what do they want to gain? They want to gain knowledge. They're there to build relationships. But I want you to really remember this, that the baby boomer wants to be valued and they want to share their wisdom. They have a lot. They've had a lot of experience. And so we want to look for opportunities to get that baby boomer opening up and talking about um, maybe the experiences they, that they've had in the workplace. They also want to continue to grow and to learn. Generation X. Generation X, 1965 to 1980. So these are, these are people in their 40s and in their mid-30s right now. And so Generation X, if you look at this, they're starting their families right now. Maybe they're right into their families right now. So time is their currency. They don't want to waste time. They want to make sure that this meeting is effective, that it's efficient. 
So they're really focusing on where they're getting value because they're looking for career advancement. So as we're planning our meetings, we need to really keep this key so that we're attracting this generation to come to the meetings. You know, is this going to help me? Is this going to move my career along? Another thing that we've got to realize is that they're really in the midst of their families. So we're going to look for opportunities when we're picking up maybe the places that we're going to have our event. We've got a lot of Gen Xers. They may actually bring the kids along. So we've got to begin to think more about, is this venue going to fit that Gen X personality, right? They also want to gain knowledge. They enjoy technology and productivity. So let's move on now to the millennial. I love talking about the millennials. I am a millennial evangelist because I do see the future. 45% of the workforce today are millennials, and by 2025, it's going to be 75%. So I'm on board, man. I'm watching with the young people. I'm looking at what they're doing. I'm into a little bit of pop culture because I believe that I've got to get on board, especially when I look at the personality and the types at my meetings. I see a lot of millennials. So for millennials, time, speed, they're impatient. So they want... They want their information quickly, right? They are into advancement and into leadership. So who am I going to meet with at this conference? Will this help my career? Will I learn more about leadership? They're, they're really thinking about these key pieces when they're making a decision as to what session to attend or even what meeting to go to. They uh, want experiences, and I think this is important, and I'm going to bring this up later. So when we're starting to look at conferences right now, we are looking at what sort of an experience are we giving this generation? What sort of experience are we giving this audience because they're looking for that? And of course, they're into learning and new technologies. So this is just a brief sampler of them. Um, so what I want to do right now is kind of get into it, right? So let's go. Let's move it. So, what so I Allison, do we want to take a poll to see uh, what people are, where they place themselves? Allison is just stepping back into the room here. Hi, Allison. He wanted to know if he wanted to take a poll right now. Sure. All right. Let's do it. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. So here's what you see on your screen, a quick poll where let's do a what is your generational category. So I'm going to fill it out for with mine. Let's see. I'm thinking you're a Gen X. You think I'm a Gen X? Thank you. I do. Yeah. I like that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to burst your bubble at some point, Karen. Oh, no, don't, don't. No. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you while people are voting, and we're going to take another maybe 10 seconds to vote, but okay. Karen, while you're speaking, I'm thinking and looking at those numbers. Yeah. And, you know, baby boomers for the longest time have really driven trends because there's been this bulge in the demographic, you know, uh, group coming up, right? Every time, at, at every stage of life, they're driving this, they're driving, <laughs> dictating what's going on. But soon, it's, I, I, the millennials are going to take over. The shift, don't you feel it? Yeah, and if you think about the baby boomer, they really were in control for really 30 years. And so... As they're retiring, and as they're, some of them are going on and opening new businesses, we are seeing a big shift happening right now. And we'll, we're going we're gonna to talk about where we're all moving towards, because, because you're right. It's happening now. Okay. Now, we are going to take a look at the results. Joe, I might need your help here, because I don't see the results. Okay, it looks like we've got 52% at Gen X, 32% okay. at Gen Y, and Millennial. So 52% Gen X? On, on question one. Yeah, 50, and how much for Gen Y? Gen Y was 32. Okay. 32. And boomers were 18, and zero at traditionists. Traditionalist boomer. Well, zero is about what Karen was saying. That's how many we've got in the workforce today. Well, that's good. I'm glad we got this. Is good. These are good numbers. These are good numbers. So, should I move on? Let's bust the myths. Are you ready? Do you, do you want the answers to the other or the uh, the numbers for the others? The other questions. Karen. 
I do not. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really. Uh, I thought the first one was going to be who okay. there, but you guys, you leave it. I'm not sure on the question. I'm okay. kind of following you. All right. Well, if people have answered, Joe, I'm going to suggest uh, that we answer the next one, which is okay. which generational characteristics do you identify. Right. With? Absolutely. Yep. So again, uh, Gen X is 53 percent. Uh, Gen Y millennial is 32 percent. Boomer is 15 and traditionalist is zero again. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to th uh, question three. Uh, we've got. 26% at less than five years, 29% from six to 10 years, 26% from 11 to 20 years, oh. and 18% 21 and plus. Lots of experience mm -hmm. here. Lots of experience. So, good spread across all, um, all answers there. And uh, question four, uh, we've got 3% at the traditionalist, 38% mm. at Boomer, 44% at Gen X and 15% at Gen Y millennial. Well, that's interesting. So it sounds like um, it's not that far off from the percentages of people in the workforce today. Looks like boomers are a little uh, underrepresented at, at conferences and events while uh, Gen Xers are a little over. Did I get that right? Yes. Yep. Yes. That's exactly right. That's what I'm seeing. How about you, Michelle? I mean, that's pretty much my audiences are the, the biggest concentration are Gen X. Yeah. yeah. And I get, and well, my, my events and shows, I get a lot of boomers as well, a lot. So it's, it's mostly those two groups that I see. Uh, but we're getting a lot more of the younger people coming up and they're interesting, interested in what we're doing. And if, for me, I'm, I'm always, half of me is wondering, well, what do I have to do differently to, in, if anything, to engage them? So, let, Karen, back to you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what. So, what I did, I created um, things that I've been hearing out there, and I'm going to call these myths about generations and, and really about generations at going to conferences. And the first one, I think is a big one. And it says that each generation has their own unique learning style. And so I put some pictures up there of what we are assuming. The myth is that the boomer, the boomer likes to sit in chairs and they like to have what we call the sage on stage. They like to sit through a keynote, a long, especially motivational keynotes. And that seems to be what we're thinking is their, their style. The reality of it is, is it really, when we look at these things, it's their preference because this is what they've been taught. This is what they've been served. If you think about it, this is how when they went to school from the very beginning, this is what it looked like. The teacher was up in the room. The kids sat in the chairs. We raised our hands. We were quiet until we were called upon. But that's a preference. As we are unveiling and giving more opportunities and more creative ways of doing meetings, we're seeing boomers say, wait. I like this better. So number two, we have, I put that one as a Gen Xer. Gen Xers like to take notes. They like to use their technology. They like to share ideas. Number three, we're starting to put some activity into it. So I put the millennials in there. We're, we're into action right now. We're doing team building. We're doing projects. But here's where it gets interesting. Number four. Number four is we need to have opportunities where the generations talk to each other. We're finding now that each generation, it's not unique to just the millennial, each generation wants to learn from each other. And so the baby boomer, as I said before, they have a lot to share. So we need to be creating opportunities in our events where we can get all of the generations together and open and sharing. So number five is I just came from an event and they called it the quick fire. I thought it was really cool. The quick fires were out in the lobbies of this uh, beautiful area that we were in and there were like eight going on at once and if you see the woman standing there in the pink dress she was doing a session and people could come and go and it was time for interaction and if you if you wanted to just kind of get a brief taste of it you might be standing there if it was for you you would stay and engage if it wasn't you could move on these were highly attended and they were highly interactive and people loved them. We were, I was interviewing people afterwards and what they said was they liked these short little snippets where not only did they have a speaker, 
but they had an interaction and they were building relationships. So as we start to put our generations into a category where boomers just want to have that keynoter up there talking, or millennials just want to be doing team building and projects, and Gen X wants to be in and out, take their notes and go. As we make these assumptions, that's what they are, assumptions. But what we're finding, and I think I'm gonna to go to my next slide. What we're finding, hang on a second, there we go. What we're finding is there's current re research out there. Um, there's a guy named Jeff Hurt, who I love to follow Jeff's information, and research is showing us that as people engage, as they talk to each other, as they share ideas, and as they speak, they learn more. So not only do we need to listen, but as we get our audiences to share ideas and to speak, what's happening is the learning process is like doubling, and we are really getting a lot more bang for our buck. So this interactive piece, maybe it's been brought out by millennials, maybe, but maybe we're just learning a lot more about how people really learn and how people engage and what pulls them into a conference. So I want you to begin to think about variety. I want you to look at your audience. I want you to think about how can not only I serve what they want, but how can I give them what they need? And how can I serve that up in a way that's going to be engaging to each of them? See what I've got next. Oh, I gotta go back. I gotta go back. So I took, I was actually at a conference, this was just recently, and I want you to look at the different, and there I am, I was the oldest at the table, I'm in the picture up there, but we had every generation here. We had the baby boomer, we had the, um, we had the traditional, excuse me, we had the millennials, and we had Gen X. And this was a three hour session, nobody left. In fact, it was so much fun. We had people periscoping. We had people walking around taking pictures and putting us up on Facebook. But if you'll notice, if you look at the table, some people took notes with pad and pen. Some people were taking notes on their phone. Some people weren't taking notes at all. We had an interactive piece. There's a crown on the woman in the front. She was our team leader, and each team leader got a crown. We had a blast. Three hours, and no one left. So when we start to make assumptions, that millennials can't sit long, or they don't want sessions, they only want 20 minutes TED Talk sessions, I want you to really think about what you're giving them. What, what suggestions are you giving them? What, what activities are you giving them? What interaction are you giving them? And are, are you encouraging them to use social media? How are we keeping people engaged? This was a blast, and it was three hours, and it was just about two months ago. So in the end... You know, Karen, just before you move on, I want to give it. It, very interesting about that thing about making assumptions about yeah. what they're doing, what they're not doing, and their learning style. Friend of mine, uh, really phenomenal speaker. He was speaking on stage and in a big conference, and he was noticing this young woman in right near the front row, and she was texting the entire time. And of course, he assumed that she was texting her friends. She wasn't engaged. She couldn't care less. And you know, as a speaker, he was starting to get that speaker anxiety. Yeah. At the, at the break, she came up to him and she said to him, you know, I love your content and I was taking notes the whole time. See? On our phone. We, we get a little paranoid, don't we? When we see people looking down because we think they're not listening, but they're not only taking notes. Some of them are actually tweeting about us and we're taking pictures. I love to look at the Twitter feed after I speak and see what actually stuck and what, what they're putting out there. So we have to be more open and we have to realize that we all want choices. So I'm, I'm glad that we went. So should we just kind of move on since we kind of uh, took, yeah, let's move on with the question. So I like this one because this is another assumption that we have and that's myth number two. And it says that new technologies are going to solve all of our millennial challenges. Yeah, just do something with the phone and the millennials are going to be happy. I was actually just at a workshop where I was with mostly baby boomers and they were making assumptions that millennials don't like to talk, they just want to be on their phone. And the reality of it is, no. The truth is when we start to talk to millennials, they love the networking. They love the networking, but baby boomers, they want you there. They want to network with their friends they also want to network with leaders in an organization. They want to they want to learn more and they want to actually gather information and kind of get some of those secrets to what got you where you are today. 
So what we're assuming is that just give them something to do with their phone and they'll be happy. But the reality of it is, is that they want interaction. So I put up here some ideas. I, I thought, let me give you a sampling of how we can begin to engage not only millennials, but really all the generations with technology and with interaction. Um, people say that polling is the way to go. And actually, I just read a review that said, just let millennials do some polling and they're happy. I was at another conference recently where they did that and millennials got up and walked out. And so I asked them, why are you getting up? And they said, this poll has nothing to do with what we're talking about. It's a waste of time. So I want you to think about when you're putting technology into your program, does it fit? Or are you just using it to, as a, maybe as a, as a tool to engage millennials? Because they're, you know, it, it was cool in the beginning, but now like everybody's polling. So we want to make sure, we want to make sure that our technology fits our program. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Double Dutch later, but we're seeing that we're using more conference apps. We want interaction. And the picture up at the top was a gentleman doing a deep dive. Um, he gave a lot of content, and then they broke up into groups. And what I like is, in the photograph, is these boomers are sharing. And I think that I want you to remember this. They have information. They have experiences. Give them an opportunity to share their wisdom when you're, um, when you're, when you're creating your conference and your materials. Let me move on. So I thought this would be a good place for me to take kind of a little intermission and talk about technology because right now for planners, technology is a big part of what can make your job easier. So I have listed 10 things that I did a little bit of research on where apps and technology can help from site selection, scheduling and planning, event marketing and promotions to number four, which I'll kind of sit on for a little while, speaker selection. So this, this program is being sponsored by the Washington Speakers Bureau and by eSpeakers. If you go on the website, eSpeakers, or I think it's Washington Speakers Bureau Direct, correct? WSB Direct? Direct. Direct. You will begin to see how much of your work is being done for you. You'll begin to see speakers. You'll see their price range. You'll be able to listen to videos. And so they've done the work. And they have created speakers and put them into categories that might fit your needs. So we're using technology not only in speaker selection, but in travel. I know I use TripIt Pro. I think it's, do you use Travel Pro? Is it Travel Pro? Do you use it, Michelle, when you travel? I, I ask my wife. Yes, your wife. Okay. I count on my phone. <laughs> I, I, I do. The only problem with, I think it, it's a, I think it's TripIt or Pro. I can't remember which one. I'll have to I'll have to look it up when this is over. Is that they text me um, at 3 a.m. for my morning flight, and I I don't know about you, but I can sleep through the night, but I do hear my texts. So they wake oh, so so with with respect to that, you're right. But I sign up for all the alerts directly with the airline, and and it's true. I do prefer to make my own bookings. I know it always comes to my email address, my mobile, so. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm heavily engaged in technology on that front. Yeah, it's called yeah, it's it's trip at travel organizer. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Thank you. I have, I have a whole team here, guys. I am yes. so lucky to be here. Well, and, and and while you're on the subject, Karen, I'll tell you that eSpeakers has a great uh, travel plugin with their platform, and I rely on that well as well. They do. I you know I have been. I think I'm an original Joe with eSpeakers. I use their their format for everything. It really, it, it's my organizer for my entire trip. So technology is really helping our business in the, in the event business. It's helping us um, with the event apps. Here's what I wanted to stop at number six. Every, every conference I go to right now, they have download the event app. It was fun in the beginning, but I'm hearing people that go to conferences over and over again, they really don't want to download an app. So event apps, there's going to be um, Double Dutch. I don't know if any of you ever used Double Dutch, but Double Dutch is an app where you can put your own event right into Double Dutch. Um, Double Dutch also has a lot of interaction and gamification. Sometimes when I'm at a conference, I'll ask people, what's your favorite app? These are the conference goers, and they love Double Dutch. So it might be something that you want to look into. It also helps with registration and live streaming. So live streaming is a biggie. Live streaming is happening at the conferences where I am speaking. So if you miss a speaker, you're watching it on live streaming. You maybe didn't get to the conference, but you can see it on live streaming, which, which really helps, um, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. 
and the last one is data and analytics and engagement. So these are just some of the ways that the tools can help you not only with, uh, with your speakers, but also in planning the entire meeting. So I'll stop here. So are there any questions? Anybody? So Anyone once else? again, if you, want to, if you want, have any questions, you use there's a Q&A app at the bottom. And uh, feel free to open that up, type in your question. We'll see it. We'll answer it. Uh, just somebody asked a question earlier when you were doing the poll. Karen, uh, they, were, they were saying that they couldn't choose both Gen X and Boomer and Gen Y in terms of the event attendees. So for that person, it's, uh, although most they found are Gen X, they're followed closely by Boomer and a few Gen Ys as well. So I think it's, you know, roughly the, roughly the same, maybe a little bit of, of, a, of a switch in terms of the prior, of the, uh, groups that they see at their audience, but still pretty close. Yeah, it, it's going to, and I, I hate to say it, but every year, right, it's going to shift a little bit more towards, towards the millennial. So, yeah. so let's move on to my next myth. Okay, this is an interesting one. And I want to talk about this one particularly because boomers are young. The boomers that are at the meetings, they're in their 50s, right? They're in their, or their 60s, but boy, they're looking good. And maybe three or four years ago, we would have said, oh man, those boomers, they don't like to use their phones. But I think that we've had a massive shift. Technology's been around a while, right? Boomers are just as apt to pick up their phone, they're tweeting, they are into it. So I think we, we do them a disservice when we think of them as, uh, oh man, they're not into technology, because boomers are using their phones. They, uh, they, in fact, I've asked people, how far would you drive if you left your phone at home? And then the entire audience is 30, 40 miles. I mean, we depend on our phones. So I think that as technology really becomes more and more a part of our lives, we are seeing that all the generations that are coming to our conferences are using the technology. So this brings me to a piece that I think is... Mara, I just, want, I just want to stop a second. We've got uh, Dina asking a question, and I think it's relevant right here. She's asking, do you think uh, attendance at meetings is going to drop over the years? Because you mentioned live streaming. Uh, do you think it's going to drop due to live streaming and new technologies? Question. I love that question, and I'm going to get to it after the slide. No. If we begin to think about some of the things we're talking about today, the experience. I think that just as my friend Crystal said, I can get all of those, those breakout sessions. I can listen to them on tape. Yeah, you can. But there are experiences, there are networking, there are relationships that go on at the conference that we have to realize cannot happen through technology. The studies are showing a lot of the companies that I work with are back to face-to-face -face meetings because they're realizing that the relationship the understanding of the team, the growth of the culture only happens during face-to-face -face, or happens more. I won't say only happens. Yeah. But I uh, think Karen, I'm, so, I'm so happy to hear you say that. Uh, there's something that I say at my shows and it's that the more digitally connected we become, the more we actually crave opportunities to have the human connection. I did, yesterday, two days ago, it was with all baby boomers, and they were telling me that millennials only want to text. And that's not true. Yeah. That's not true. It, you know, when you look at technology and you look at anything that's new, I talk a lot on change. Okay, yeah, it started. And in the beginning, we try it. We live for it. We're on it. But then we go back. The, that wears off, and we go back to mm -hmm. seeing people, relating to people, meeting people face-to-face, -face. you know, it's, it was interesting, it was new in the beginning, but now we're realizing that this face-to-face -face and building really rela true relationships help us grow our careers, and that's really where we are. That's yeah. why we're where I'm, yeah, Where I'm seeing the differences across the generations is not in technology or no technology, but in platform. So yeah. the boomers might be more into Facebook, and the younger generations are more into Instagram. I'm glad you said that. It brings me to my next slide. That, that is an assumption that is not true. I thought the same thing. So I've been doing research. Pew Research just came out with the people on Facebook right now. And I'm not going to give you the numbers. I could say 90%, but, I, you know, but it is so tremendous. The people that are on Facebook right now, 
it's it blows the other social medias out of the water. And right now they polled 61% of millennials, 61% say that they are on Facebook at least 10 to 12 times a day. We're talking about 10 to 12 times a day. These are millennials. So yeah, they love their Instagram, actually. They love their Snapchat. They love putting their faces on Snapchat. They love it. But when you look at the charts, Facebook is way ahead. That's why we should, no, I was not gonna say buy Facebook stock. But Facebook is so far ahead of all of the others. But social is the way we are going to really um, advertise our meetings. So you've gotta really understand the power of social. You've gotta understand what to put on Facebook. I can't go into all of this today, but I am sure that there are gonna be other webinars that will really go into how we market our meetings through social media. But think about the pictures that you're putting up on Facebook. Are they attracting the attendees that you want to come? Because Facebook is social. And so we want to have people having fun. We want to show that our meetings are alive. We want to show the experiences of our meeting rather than marketing the words or the poster. We want people in the marketing. And we want to use social before. We want to use social during. We want you to tweet out all of the exciting things that you're hearing, all the quotes that are going on. We want those, we want you to be live using Twitter and we also want to use social for our post meeting. So we're using video, maybe after the meeting, we're also using video, we're getting speakers now to create more and more videos to entice people to come to the conference. Look at this, this is free. If you begin to look at Facebook and Pinterest, I mean, you can put the pictures up there, live streaming, you realize, my gosh, we have an arsenal right here at our hands. Who do we have on our marketing team? Do we have people that know and understand this? Do we have people that love it and enjoy it? Because we can really benefit from using social media to market our meetings. And baby boomers are looking at Facebook as well as millennials. How about you, Gen X? I don't know. Are you on it too? I'm sure you are. Anything there, Michelle? No, we're good. Okay, cool. Let me move on. Good. Move it into my, oh, my favorite son. The millennials are here. The millennials are here. Yeah, they scare you. They excite me. The millennials excite me. So what I thought I would do is kind of take a breather here and tell you about my interview with Michael Fisher. So I go to a lot of HR conferences where I do hear a lot about Oracle and their phenomenal onboarding. Oracle is known for onboarding millennials. They, they have onboarded thousands and they actually have a software that helps organizations onboard. So Michael Fisher, um, he went to uh, s and uh, excuse me, he went, I can't remember where he went to school, but it was in Texas. Um, and I heard about Michael and I decided to give him a call and ask him what the onboarding process was like. And he had just come back. He was so excited. Um, they flew him from Austin to San Francisco, and he told me that there were about 360 coming from all over in his class. And he said what he loved the most about it, besides the great food and the great drink, was the networking. He said, I met so many people, I realized that I'm not in this alone. We switched emails and phone numbers, and we made friends, and he said, I realized that I have a support team. But more than that, he said, the leadership team was there and they stayed at the cocktail hour and they talked to each of us and I want you to hear this he talked about the leadership he talked about the way they talked about the culture at Oracle he said they said things that scared me they used harsh words and I realized that it was going to be hard work probably harder than anything I ever did at SMU he said but I realized that there's there's a reward because people stay and I want to be part of that He's 22 years old. He's motivated. Sometimes we wonder, how do we motivate young people? We motivate young people maybe very differently than we were motivated because they want to be a part of a team. They want to have relationships and they want to have friends. He felt like he had made 300 friends with this. And he, uh, the other day when I called him to see how things were going, he couldn't talk because he was going to a work happy hour. So... Michael opened my eyes to the enthusiasm and the motivation of young millennials. And I hope to see him at a conference someday when I'm speaking for Oracle. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm gonna move on. So, hang on. So, the question that we all wanna know is, so what do millennials want? Well, we hear this a lot. 
I'm not going to say any negative words about millennials because every generation, if you study generations throughout history, every generation that precedes the generation says something negative about that generation. It, a lot of it has to do with youth. A lot of it has to do with um, maybe visions of the future. But let's really tap into what millennials want today. And remember, this is a wide age because we're going from people in their 20s all the way down, all the way up to 35. They want an experience. I was just at this conference. I took this picture. Um, this was a total interactive experience. And I think when we talk about putting things on live stream, we've got to realize that we want people that are listening to live stream to say, oh, man. I wish I'd been there. I can't believe I missed this meeting. I can't believe I missed this conference. Look at the fun they had. Look at the people that, they, that are interacting. Next time, I'm gonna go. So we have to begin to think about as we create our experiences, experiences, our sessions, some of the things that we do to make them so that we've got an enticement to people to say, I've gotta to get to that next one. I heard what you did, that experience was great and I wanna be there. These millennials, they love an experience, and they also love an experience. If you look at the ages, this, this just happened. We've got every generation in that picture because not only are they having fun, but they're networking and they're getting to know maybe people who are higher up in their organization or maybe just a new onboarded new hire, right? So experiences matter. So what else do they want? Well, as I told you with my nephew, Michael, they want social interaction, right? They want to be a part of the team. They want to be a part of a team, not only with their peers, but they want to know their superiors. I just came back from a conference. Um, it was a fabulous hotel chain. I was in the Northeast, and it was all millennials in sales. But Bob and Dave were there, and Bob and Dave are senior executives. And, Barb and first of all, Bob and Dave looked pretty hip. I liked what they had on. They looked like they were totally, they were totally cool. But Bob and Dave put on a podcast once a month. And that podcast is so much fun that millennials were telling me they never miss it. In the podcast, they teach ideas and techniques towards sales. So it's a teaching podcast, but they've created it and they're serving it up in a way where it's fun, it's social, and they want to be a part of it. So I want you to begin to think about how we're presenting our information and our material. They want meaningful connections, which I have talked about. They want knowledge building, okay? They want relative information that's going to help them not only grow their knowledge base, but also grow their careers. They want to be an active participant. So they do enjoy the polling when it relates the Q&A with mics. So begin to think about deeper dives. We begin to think about some of the ways we're presenting, even our keynote, where we can have microphones in the audience where they can get up and they can ask questions, they can introduce themselves to the team and they can be a part of it. And here's the fun part that I kind of like. I was just in Austin at a conference and all of the events were on, not in the hotel, but they were on 6th Street. So millennials want to have integration with the local destination. So we begin to think about now, not only that hotel, but we begin to think about some of the places that we go that are near the hotel. A little sidebar though, baby boomers do still enjoy the hotel bar. Uh, I was there and so were they. Anyway, any, anything there? Nope. We're good. Right. How about this one? Let's do some good, okay? So we also want involvement. So there are also opportunities where we can take the attendees and we can have them doing good. Uh, this is food for fighting food for hunger. This was a great interactive uh, activity that had, look, you can see all the generations there. So in between our sessions, they had an actual involvement where we were doing good and, and making uh, packages to send to Africa. It was pretty cool. So I'm getting close to the end right now. I just saw this. I always like to put something I've just read or just seen um, in, in my programs. And I like this one. This was just in Fast Company. I don't know if you saw it. But um, one, of the, uh, one of the directors at Pfizer had just seen the movie The Intern. And she decided that they were going to bring in an intern at Pfizer. And so they brought in Paul. There's Paul. He's a 70-year-old, and Paul's wife that summer, she was thinking of a, of a trip to Europe. Paul was thinking of interning, and, and Paul went out, and he uh, was the summer intern advisor. The article, it, it actually 
made me feel that I have value because sometimes we forget as we age and we begin to think about, you know what, I'm, I'm really not very relevant anymore. Take time if you're a baby boomer out there or if you're doing meetings with baby boomers to use that experience. Because what we found with this was in the beginning, they didn't know what to do with Paul. And by the end, Paul was best friends with everyone. They were, they were switching, they were giving off of their email addresses and he was going to stay connected to all of them. But he was a resource, he was a resource. And the millennials loved him. They loved hanging around with Paul. And Paul wore that suit every day. Every day, he didn't, uh, he didn't modify his dress at all. He came in as the real Paul, and the kids loved it. And so we begin to realize that, just as I started talking about Crystal, that each generation has something to offer if we are willing to listen, if we are willing to plan meetings where the attendees are part of the program. So I'm kind of winding it down right now, and I, I thought about... What would, if I wanted you to think of three things to take away, what would it be? Everyone wants to build their knowledge. Everybody wants to have career. No matter where we are, we want to continually grow our career. We're coming to meetings for networking. Are you giving networking enough time? Are you really valuing it? Because this is really what's going to determine if people become to our face-to-face -face meetings or if they can just get it online. It's that relationship that we're building and that deeper networking. And lastly, and I'm kind of excited about this, it's the experiences. So if you're doing a meeting that has Gen Xers, I want you to think family. Maybe you're going to pick a hotel that's got that lazy river in it so that the kids are enjoying the hotel or the venue just as much as you are at the conference. So we begin to look at the generations. We begin to say, okay, even though we're not totally stereotyping, we're beginning to understand what the needs are and how we can really tap into what these needs are and maybe tweak our conference or our meetings just a little to begin to attract the generations that we want. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Michelle, and see if there's any other questions. Well, that's great. In fact, we do have a question. Okay. And so in the last few minutes that we have in this webinar series, I just wanted to in invite, encourage people to once again go to the chat box or the Q&A box that I think at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little icon that says Q&A, and uh, ask a question if there, or um, make a comment or suggestion. Now we do have a question actually from one of the participants and Dina asks, do you think that employees between 25 and 35 uh, so if I've been listening correctly, that's millennials, right? Yes. Oh no, that's Jenna. That's 25 and 35 are millennials. Millennials. Okay. Had to get that straight. Do you think that employees between 25 and 35 will not be a great percentage of attendees at meetings regardless due to the way they participate in family life versus traditional boomers? So I guess to answer that, Karen, we need to know, well, what is the difference that you see or in your research if you have it because it's not exactly well first of all we gotta look at you know we're getting into studying millennials and there's two groups of millennials as there are in every generation but there are the millennials that that are single uh -huh. and they're right and they're um they're there's i'm just gonna say they're single i'm not gonna say that they're having a lot of fun. And then there's the millennials that are not only married, but they have children. And so what we're finding is that as the millennial or Gen Y, as they begin to take on responsibilities, they're getting more like Gen X. Mm. So a lot of their needs are going to fall into Gen X. So they are going to be looking at family. And I see lots and lots of families at conferences. I'm not saying that this is right for your conference. I am just saying that I've seen, I have actually even seen, um, dads walking around with their kids, getting them off to something before they come to a session. Um, so I am i don't know if that's a trend. I'm just telling you what I see. I'm seeing conference planners, if they want families to attend, I think companies, she said employees. So I think that that's something that a company is going to have to think about with their culture. I think that they're going to have to decide, is this going to be something that we are going to give? I think we're going to see companies shifting and changing so I'd like to watch that myself, but I would think that that would be something that would attract, when she said millennials that have families, that it will attract them to come to the meeting. Mm -hmm. You know what, in the time that we have left, Karen, I would love to put this question out 
to the participants. Okay. We all, I mean, we saw at the very beginning how much experience we have on this webinar in attendees. It's fantastic. So we've all been to a lot of events and conferences. I am wondering what people have seen in their own experiences that has worked to engage cross-generational cross -generational audiences. Now, what has worked? Maybe you've tried it yourself. Maybe you've seen, maybe a friend, a professional planner has tried, or maybe you've heard of something. I'd love to you to put that in, and you could put that in the Q&A as well. Well, I tried this, or I saw this, and it really seemed to work well. Now, while you're thinking of that, Karen, we've got another question. The question yes. is coming right in. Uh, somebody is asking, I am struggling to recruit okay. younger attendees. I am in government. They are mostly traditional boomers, so the older generations. The government, would, they, the government is struggling. open to any ideas on how to attract younger participants. So now she's talking about attracting younger participants to her meetings or to the job. I, well, I she, she, uh, well, the, the question is recruiting younger attendees. So I'm assuming she means two events. Okay, now, well, here, those three things, that slide that you had over there, uh, and I'm pointing over there because that screen there. is there for me. <laughs> uh, you said network, uh, uh, networking was the first one. Remember, they want to network. They like networking with each other, but and this is important for government, they want to have a leadership at a network. So baby boomers, don't leave the networking event and go to the bar, because that's what I see. You have to stay there. So I think you have to, as you're talking to your leadership team before your conference, you have to really tell them that we are going to get more younger people to, our, to attend at least our, our sessions if they know that you are going to be there, because they want to network with leaders. They want to see leadership, not just their peers. They enjoy their peers, but they'll do that after hours. But let's make sure that our, our leaders are at the networking. Number two, I government, I know you. You've got to make it fun. You've got to begin to think about, um, remember I said experience. So if you're trying to get them to your conference, you've got to play up that experience. You've got to really talk about some of the places that um, will be open to them that they can go to at, during the conference. And Karen, I think this is worth repeating, and I was writing some notes down, so I missed it. And if I missed it, maybe other people missed it, but that key, so that last slide you had uh, that says the three things that people are looking for. They want knowledge. They want, okay. So you said networking, knowledge, and experience. I say knowledge, career building. So I'm not just going to learn. I want to know what are the secrets? You know, what are those unwritten rules? What are the what are some of the things that I can gain so that when I leave this conference, I can move up an, an, a notch? I think we forget career. We are so focused on um, teaching them maybe the fundamentals of their work that we're forgetting. How do we get some of those leadership qualities? So keep that in mind when you're doing your conference personal development and uh, and that experience which I think is kind of fun to think about so what kind of experiences what kind of speakers am I using if you want to get Millennials to come you've got to have a speaker that maybe does a, a, a YouTube video inviting them that isn't standing there like this talking that's engaging that they look at the speaker and they go, hey I want to go to that 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 looks good that looks interesting Sometimes we market things to look boring. Millennials, I don't think anyone likes boring. I'm not going to just, I, I don't, <laughs> you, boring, I don't like boring. See, Karen, when I take a look at those three things, yeah. I see that those are things that would appeal to all the generations. Right. It's That's the what flavor, I mean. it's how you, the content of those three things. So the content of the networking, you talk about sharing across generations, uh, the knowledge, the types of knowledge that each of them want, and of course the experiences. And remember when she, who, who the, the question she said, how can I get young people to my, my meetings? Look at how you're marketing that meeting. So if you are using a social, who are you putting in that Facebook ad? They want to see their friends coming. They want to see. So when we're marketing a meeting baby boomers and we want millennials to come, don't just put baby boomers on the Facebook page. Put young people on the Facebook page. Put millennials. Put the generation 
that you're trying to attract in the Facebook posts? Okay, you know, Karen, you've given me a lot of things to think about. I know I am going to be reviewing this presentation in the next few days again because I was busy hosting, writing notes, and doing, but you covered so much ground. I know that there's no way that you could have covered everything you wanted to. Uh, how can people get in, the, get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Um, well, you can go to Karen at KarenMcCullough.com. You can email me, Karen at KarenMcCullough.com. And we might actually do something, right, Washington Speaker Bureau? WSBDirectConnect.com. 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 And we're even thinking about putting up a blog to take this even further and maybe add some, some, of, the, some, of, my, uh, some of my slides. We'll go into depth, and I might give you some of the technology, those top 10 things. I'll give you some suggestions of, of apps and sites to go to. But if you have any questions at all, send them well, in. And we'll get them covered. We've, we've got all the questions covered. What I'm going to suggest, if people do have questions, because some of these things, you know, you think of them, oh, darn, I wish I had asked that question, and it's just after the webinar closes. So I think that there's a way using the blog that people could still stay in touch and keep the conversation going. Let's so do it. Karen, I, I, wanna, I wanna give you a huge thank you for this. This is the benefit of your experience, your expertise, your knowledge. It's been really helpful. I know that the professional planners who have been on this webinar uh, got a lot of it uh, out of it. I know I have. Uh, very thought provoking, some tangible takeaways of specific things that we could do in our events to enhance, engage, cross generations at our events and conferences. Now, I'd also want to thank WSB Direct Connect because this is kind of a new initiative for them. And I think it's a phenomenal way to get information out to help us all create better events and conferences. It powered by eSpeakers. I want to give a big thanks to Joe who's been on this at eSpeakers. It's fantastic. Um, so what WSB D, what WSB Direct Connect does, it's really a Speakers Bureau correct, curated by Washington Speakers Bureau. And what it does is it connects you to world-class speakers for under $10,000. Now, I know you mentioned the URL before. I'm going to say it again now. It's www.wsbdirectconnect.com. And I know if people go there, they'll find you, Karen, on it. And they'll find me on it. So this is this is good. And so thank you and thank you for uh, to everyone at WSB Direct Connect for putting this together and having us be part of it. I know I was excited. Yes, Karen? Yes, yes. And I'm here with WSB. Look at this beautiful room. So thank you guys. I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Joe. This has been okay. great. Allison's over here. <laughs> thank you, Allison. Well, listen. Before we run out of time, I want to tell you about our next webinar because it's just as exciting as this one. It's called Maximum, Maximize the Power of Inclusion and Engagement at Your Meetings. It is scheduled for November the 10th. And so I'm going to invite everybody on this webinar to join us with internationally recognized author and con consultant Lenora Billings Harris. Now, I've heard her speak. I was at one of her conferences. I think she's amazing. She is going to examine and kind of reframe our approach to diversity, inclusion, and attendee engagement at meetings. So once again, you could learn more all about this. You can register at www.washingtonspeakers.com webinars. That's www.washingtonspeakers.com webinars. So I think that's it. We're out of time. I want to thank everybody for being on this webinar, and I am looking forward to seeing you on November the 10th. Thank you. Bye.